Hi, everyone. This is John Davis of Octo. Uh, welcome to the webinar on ocean technology. Uh, we'll get started in a few seconds. We're just waiting for, for everyone to file in. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Again, my name is John Davis. I'm president of Octo, or Open Communications for the Ocean. Uh, we provide ocean professionals with the knowledge and networks you need. Uh, we host this webinar series, as well as the MPA Help Discussion List, EBM Help Discussion List, the Ocean Plastic List, and other services. Uh, thanks for being here. Also with me is Sarah Carr, uh, who runs each of the Octo projects I just mentioned to you, and she's handling the technical side of this webinar. Octo is co-presenting this webinar with Impact 5, the 5th International Marine Protected Areas Congress, which will be held this coming February 3rd through 9th in Vancouver, Canada. Impact is always the global conference with regard to MPA planning and practice. And if you're planning, if you're attending this webinar, uh, I assume you're interested in MPAs, and I encourage you to attend Impact in person or virtually uh, if you're not already registered. It will be worth your time. Uh, so to find out more or to register, go to impact5.ca, um, as, as I think you'll see on screen if you don't already, um, if, that, uh, if we have that, that screen uh, set up, but impact5.ca is the website. And on that website, you can also find out more about the ocean technology and innovation session that will be at Impact 5, and today's webinar is a preview of that session. Uh, so existing and emerging ocean technology has tremendous potential for helping MPAs address management needs. And in this webinar, experts from three leading ocean technology institutions, Open Ocean Robotics, Whale Seeker, and Global Fishing Watch, uh, will share how their products can help MPAs, and they'll answer any questions you have. Uh, and in addition, we encourage you in the audience to share your own experiences with ocean tech for MPA management, and you can share those experiences in the webinar chat function, and we can all benefit from your insights. So this is how the webinar will work. Our three presenters, Julie Angus of Open Ocean Robotics, Emily Chari tissier of Whale Seeker, and Anna Sanders of Global Fishing Watch will each provide a short presentation on their respective projects. Then we'll open the floor to questions from the audience for the remainder of the webinar. And we'll conclude the event about an hour from now. So if you have any questions during the webinar, you can put them in the Q&A panel and we'll be checking that space over the course of this webinar. So let's get started. Our first webinar, our first presenter is Julie Angus. Uh, Julie is the CEO and co-founder of Open Ocean Robotics, a marine robotics and data analytics company. Uh, she is the best-selling author, scientist, and explorer who received National Geographic's uh, let's see here. Uh, Adventure of the Year Award when she became the first woman to row across the Atlantic Ocean from mainland to mainland. Julie has written three books, has a graduate degree in microbiology, and is a serial entrepreneur who co-founded two previous ocean-focused businesses. Julie is a director on NATO's Maritime Unmanned System Initiative Innovation Advisory Board and the Center for Ocean Applied Sustainable Technologies Advisory Board. Julie has an honorary doctorate from McMaster University and is a Royal Canadian Geographic Society Fellow. In 2020, she was awarded Innovator of the Year by BC Business, and in 2021, she was recognized as industry icon by the BC clean tech industry. So this is Julie Angus. Um, thank you, John, and thank you for the privilege of being able to share our technology uh, with you here today. So I co-founded Open Ocean Robotics uh, about four years ago with really the goal to advance technology that can help us better protect and understand oceans. And that desire really came from uh, a passion for the oceans, and, and I have spent a lot of time on it in, in small boats, exploring it, and, and just really seeing and understanding how difficult it is to be out there and how we need better solutions and 
uh, you know, technology can offer uh, some solutions to some of the key challenges we're, we're facing. Um, and of course, when we think about marine protected areas, I mean, it's, it's critically important to protect our oceans, but then also have a way to monitor and enforce those regulations to ensure that they really truly are protected. Uh, and that's going to be incredibly hard with existing technologies. You know, we have a, a global ambition to protect 30% of our oceans by 20 30, uh, we also need a way to monitor them to ensure that um, they truly are protected. And when you think about the way that that we typically do things now, which is dependent on, on large ships, uh, there's no way we can scale those solutions. There's just an, they're too costly, uh, difficult to operate in limited supply. And of course, there's environmental um, impacts of uh, having that many boats monitoring the oceans in terms of greenhouse gas pollution and, and, and noise pollution as well. Uh, so robotic technology like ours really has the potential to um, monitor these marine protected oceans. It's a scalable solution. You can deploy many of these vehicles with, uh, you know, a single pilot um, monitoring them as they're out there. Uh, it's a fraction of the cost of a crewed ship and, and it's a sustainable. Um, they're completely solar powered, so there's no greenhouse gas emissions, no risk of oil spills. They're very quiet vehicles so you're not adding uh, to any kind of noise pollution. And uh, there's there's a lot of innovative technology that that goes into these vehicles. And in our case, um, we have a uh, innovative uh, patent pending self writing system that allows it to go in very challenging open ocean conditions, um, self write, uh, so that it can be out for extended periods of time and basically get hit by any kind of weather that you might encounter. Um, it's also very shallow water capable, so you can go all the way from near shore to open ocean. Um, it's modular in terms of the sensors you put on there so you can measure a lot of oceanographic uh, conditions as well as um, you know look for uh, vessels and, and identify them as well as potentially the activities on them. Uh, it's over the horizon control so you can send them you know most places in the world and you can operate them from the, the control room um, where, wherever it's located if it's here in Victoria or a, a remote one somewhere else. Uh, we uh, are out there right now. We're working with a range of customers. Um, we are testing our boats. Um, they are uh, very seaworthy. Here it is in the surf break off the west coast of Vancouver Island, where it definitely surfs better than I do. Um, we've had, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you actually about one of the projects we, we've done in, in uh, illegal fishing enforcement, um, which has been one of our, our longest deployments um, to date. Uh, you know, although we, we produce robot boats, really we're a data company and uh, provide that data. So, uh, and that's dependent on the sensors that we put on the vessels. So we have a core suite of sensors that includes um, cameras, both optical and, and thermal. So for day and night uh, vision, um, AIS transponder, uh, a weather station, some simple oceanographic sensors. And then we can also put other things on it, like an acoustic array to, to listen for marine mammals or to listen for vessels or indicators of fishing activities, such as putting a, a trap down. Um, we have a, a range of oceanographic sensors that we've put on there, everything from measuring turbidity and chlorophyll A to seafloor mapping, ocean current profiling. Um, so they can be really flexible vehicles that can um, monitor the health of an MPA as, as well as adherence to, to fishing regulations. Um, it is a services company, um, so we provide the boats, plan the mission, ship them out, deploy them, operate them, provide the data in real time, um, and then also archival data as well. I, in terms of the, the projects that we've done that are, are sort of relevant to, to MPAs, we, we have a, an ongoing project um, in protecting uh, MPAs to deter illegal fishing that, that I'll talk about. Um, we've done work protecting marine mammals so on the west coast of, of Canada. We have the endangered southern resident killer whale populations. So uh, using acoustics to de determine where they are, pattern of life, that sort of thing, um, and detecting vessels. Um, for other types of security threats. We have a, a vessel right now that's in the Persian Gulf doing work in maritime domain awareness for the US Navy. We've also worked with the, the Canadian Navy 
Um, but I think sort of most interesting for this is to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing in illegal fishing enforcement and MPA monitoring. Um, and this uh, it's been a three plus year project already. It's um, supported by a US philanthropic organization called Ocean Kind and, and we're working with Wild Aid. And the goal is really to scale marine robotic technologies to help protect some of these MPAs. Um, so last year, as part of this, we did a 25-day uh, continuous deployment in a marine sanctuary in Hawaii, um, where we were really testing and demonstrating our ability to operate in an MPA. Uh, this year, we're continuing to um, advance our technology using multiple vehicles, improving our, our vessel detection, uh, and um, continuing to demonstrate so that we can be fully commercially operational um, next year and ready to scale out to, to MPAs um, potentially around the world. Um, so in this case, the, the goal was really to uh, test our USV in a real world, challenging conditions, strong winds, big waves, uh, to run a sense, suite of sensors for vessel detection, as well as ocean health monitoring, and to get a feel for how long can we run these sensors, what is it like sending it in real time, um, how can we continue to improve this technology to, to monitor uh, MPAs, and how could this technology potentially be used to deter uh, illegal fishing, um, either for uh, interdiction, closer monitoring, or potentially even prosecution. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, it's a platform for a bunch of different sensors. In this system, we outfitted it with an acoustic uh, array. So it was a, a single hydrophone um, with onboard processing. Uh, we had cameras that included a 360 degree optical camera as well as a thermal camera. Uh, we had a, a weather station, wind speed, wind direction, barometric pressure, air temperature, uh, and we had um, underwater sensors for measuring um, water temperature, uh, salinity, turbidity, chlorophyll A, and those are all modular sensor platforms. So we could swap those out and put in, in different sensors as well. Uh, in, in total, the mission was um, 25 days or 600 hours. So it was continuously operated. We deployed it from a boat launch ramp. It went out to position. It patrolled an area for that duration and then it came back afterwards. So very easy to deploy, uh, very straightforward to operate. Uh, it, it went in a range of uh, conditions from very shallow near shore to you know, deep waters farther offshore, uh, encountered a range of wind speeds going up to over 50 miles per hour. On average, the USV uh, travels pretty slow, uh, you know, about one mile, one to two miles per hour. And that's a combination of it's loitering, it's slowly maneuvering, uh, but it does have the ability to go faster. Um, so in this case, the, the fastest we went was nearly seven miles per hour. And, and that might be advantageous if you have uh, some strong currents or if you need to get to position a little bit quicker. It is completely remotely piloted, um, so we have a uh, control platform to control the USV as well to, as to see the data coming in. Uh, so this allows us to pre-program a route, but we can adjust it if we need to, if we see something interesting, if we want to sample more, if we want to change where we're monitoring. Uh, and it has satellite cellular radio communication, so redundancy in communication and the ability to stay in touch no matter where you are. Uh, here's just some pictures of the optical and the, the thermal feeds, and those are coming in real time. Uh, so with the human in the loop, we can identify the type of vessel as well as activity potentially. Um, we're also detecting AIS, so detecting it at a higher frequency than you would from satellite, um, and also potentially detecting um, the things that you might not detect, and it can also um, be useful for validating the AIS with visuals as well as combating AIS spoofing. 
In this case, we also had an underwater camera um, because we were traveling over some shallow areas some some coral as well. So you can see a range of uh, things with that as well as the different oceanographic sensors. Um, moving forward, you know, we obviously have a vision how, how this technology can advance so we can provide better coverage, uh, get more data coming in um, and really um, improve how how we operate and, and monitor our MPAs. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. Uh, again, if anyone has questions for Julie, uh, please put them in the in the, uh, the Q and A panel, and we'll get to them in the Q and A session later. And I know that some have already come in. Thank you very much for for sending those in. Uh, next, we have Emily Chari Tissier. Uh, Emily is a biologist with twenty years of experience working in coastal and Arctic ecosystems. She is passionate about working with multidisciplinary teams and sustainable growth, and is the co-founder and CEO of Whale Seeker, which uses artificial intelligence or AI to automate whale detection from imagery. And they help scale whale detection for many clients, ranging from governments and private industry to NGOs. And as a certified B Corp, Whale Seeker cares about the ethics surrounding the development of their AI, as well as the use of their solutions. This is Emily Shahri Tissier. Hello, thank you very much. Let's see, share. Can you guys see my screen? Yes, good, thanks. Yes. Wonderful. So, yes. Um, yes, I'm the CEO and founder of Whale Seeker, and I'm working with a fantastic team. And um, yeah, we use, uh, we automate, uh, marine mammal detection. So we started out as just detecting whales. And so this first image here, you can see these are actually belugas from, uh, from the Arctic. And around each beluga is the certainty with which our AI has detected a whale. So this is just an example of the type of annotations that we can do for uh, aerial images. We also work with satellite imagery. Um, but yes, so we build fast, atom, uh, automated, user-friendly whale detection solutions. We're really dedicated to the ethics. Um, as John mentioned, um, as a certified B Corps, we're also a signatory of the Montreal Declaration for Responsible AI. So how we build our AI is just as important as how our AI is used. So we really want to keep the whole spectrum in mind. Um, and we think it's really important to highlight this as AI is sort of leaned on more and more to scale environmental monitoring. We don't, we would just wanna make sure that we keep the spotlight on um, doing, doing it thoughtfully. And so why, why monitor marine mammals uh, as a sentinel species? Marine mammals are important proxies for overall ecosystem health. So uh, it can either be a standalone method for marine protected area monitoring or really monitoring for for any sensitive area, so around ports, um, fishing, we work with uh, shipping lanes, we work with um, private industry and governments, so really the possibilities are endless for people who are interested in where marine mammals are, but we have expanded it to, um, to all marine mammals, so not just whales any longer, but it's one way that we can standardize um, and, and sort of understand the overall health of the ocean in certain areas. But the problem about detecting marine mammals, uh, visually in any case, is that they're detected by humans one at a time. And so this means humans looking out of an aircraft window, humans looking off the bow of a boat or from shore, as is seen in this picture, um, or humans scanning a computer screen. So a very large image, they zoom in sort of like a slide on a microscope and scan in. And one image can take 30 seconds to go through. The, the, the image is clear and there's, there are no whales or there may be a few very obvious whales or marine mammals present. Or if the water is very turbid, if the sea state is agitated, if the image quality is really poor, it can take 45 minutes to go through one image. And so you can imagine that with this amount of variability and this uncertainty, being based really just on human analysis, 
this is not a scalable solution. You don't know when you're getting your data back. You don't know how much it's going to cost. And if we're leaning on only humans, um, yeah, definitely we don't have that army of people to look through. But the problem is that we need human expertise. So, you know, just about anybody who's familiar with what a whale looks like can pick out the beautiful whale silhouette from an image. But, and they can tell if there are no whales present, if, it, if it's just sort of blank ocean. And so this is where human and AI can work together. So computers are very good at going through large amounts of data. Um, it's what humans who are highly trained don't want to waste their time doing. Um, and so what we do is we work with our clients to understand what does a whale mean to them? for example. So if we're working with, um, with an, a management organization, some of them have indicated that they are only interested in whales in the top two meters of the water column because that's how they can extrapolate a, a full population. So even though we might detect whales that are deeper or perceived to be deeper in the water column, they don't want to know about those versus if we're working with um, exclusion zones, if we're doing construction, we really need to be more trigger happy and say, we need to know if there's anything that might be in the region at all. So our, the, the, the exciting part about our team is that we have biologists as well as software developers, as well as computer vision specialists and data scientists all working under the same roof to make sure that what we detect is answering the questions that the managers need. And so I already talked about this. The solution is an automated, scalable solution. We work with any type of imagery um, within certain bounds. So you don't need a military grade camera. Um, it really, it can be either uh, a normal camera on the bottom of an, uh, through the trap of an airplane, or we can work with off the shelf. We work only with off the shelf technology. We wanna make sure that we are lowering the barriers to entry for uh, monitoring the ocean. Um, really trying to sort of bridge the divide. We don't acquire our own imagery either. We work with our clients. And so when they are gathering imagery, we help develop plans and, and add value to them and fit within their workflow, or we can help them develop a plan from square one as well. The way Mobius works is images are taken in any of the ways that I just mentioned, they are sent to us. Um, Mobius is a human in the loop, so it's AI merged with um, an expert annotator. So um, our in-house marine biologist that has developed a lot of these protocols for detecting marine mammals from imagery. Um, we go through those iterations and uh, it's about 97% faster than doing it just human uh, annotated alone, but we do reach expert human level accuracy and which allows wildlife managers um, and all marine stakeholders to iterate on management plans much quicker um, and yeah, be able to have a, a much better impact in, in monitoring their, their areas. And then we deliver those data back to the, the managers. Uh, some of the other services that we can offer uh, for scaling marine mammal uh, uh, detection in MPAs are just image triage. So we can go through hundreds of thousands of images and say, these are the images with nothing of interest in them. And we can keep just the ones that have something, or we can go through and do the full annotation. We also do land and glare annotation as well, because it's important to know what square kilometers of detectable ocean surface there is when we're, when we're saying what types of animals and how many we've found uh, so that the managers can have an idea of the sort of the density and, and where the animals are located and where in their images we could not detect anything. And so specifically the, the MPAs that we're working with and that we have worked with in the Canadian Arctic, um, we have a contract through Innovation Solutions Canada and Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada to analyze 100,000 aerial images from Arctic 
zones monitoring the last ice area. So this is Canada. Uh, the, the, the shaded area is the, the, the last ice area. And just for scale, this is a very big zone. Uh, France and Vancouver Island are seen respectively. So you can get really the scale of, of, of what, what we're talking about here. And the areas that we have detected marine mammals in are the, the three areas that are indicated here in turquoise. And here overlapped are the protected areas, which are these two marine protected areas. And as you can tell, we haven't monitored the entirety of these marine protected areas, but you can get an idea of the scale. And if anyone is looking, is familiar with Arctic and remote work, um, it's very tricky to think of scaling, but also in such severe uh, environmental conditions where there's very low connectivity. Um, and so, yes, finding ways to do it safely, non-invasively, environmentally friendly ways, but also with standardized data so that we can make sure that images, here are some examples of some images, that images like like this that are taken year in and year out, we know what a whale means or what a seal means to this specific use case. And we can make sure that observer bias is not responsible for the variation in populations that we found in area one versus area two or year one versus year two. And so, so far the images in the Arctic that we have um, the animals that we've detected are shown here, but really the possibilities are endless all over the world. Um, it, it really just depends on what the user needs, what we can detect in the water. We work with normal cameras and infrared cameras, so it's not, it's not magic. We can't detect further than we can see in the water. Uh, for that, we'd need to collaborate with, um, with Julie, for example. Um, and so, yes, we need, we need scalable solutions that are accessible to everybody, not just the 1% that have military budgets, um, to be able to actually reach the 30-30 goals for ocean protection. I mentioned that our, our ethics are very near and dear to our heart. That also means that all of the images that we work with are collected ethically and legally. Uh, all of the training images are annotated by people who are, who are paid a decent living wage and are experts in the domain. Um, marine mammal detection is not a case where we want the, the greatest variability and diversity of people annotating images. We really want people who are trained in this specific way to give us a good training data set. This is our fantastic team, and I'm very happy to take questions. All right, thanks very much, Emily. That was great. Um, again, if anyone has questions for her, please put them in the Q&A panel, and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, and next, we have Anna Sanders. Uh, Anna leads the development and management of Global Fishing Watch's innovative products. Her team works closely with ocean stakeholders to understand their needs and co-create data-driven management tools to support the sustainable use of our oceans. With over 15 years of experience, Anna has led small and large global teams pioneering technology-based solutions to address ocean conservation and maritime security. As a distinguished U.S. Coast Guard officer, Anna provided daily intelligence briefings to the Commandant, led strategic efforts in Arctic policy and geospatial intelligence, and directed more than 20 international fisheries intelligence operations throughout the Pacific Ocean, and brought global attention to illegal fishing practices through capacity building and advocacy. In 2019, Anna received a commendation award from Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans for her role in the apprehension of an illegal high seas drift net vessel and her contributions to advancing ocean conservation and protection. Before joining Global Fishing Watch, Anna led the Skylight Project, Paul G. Allen's philanthropic technology project to end illegal fishing. 
and she holds a Bachelor of Science in Marine and Environmental Science from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and a Master of Science in Science and Technology Intelligence from the National Intelligence University. She continues to serve in the Coast Guard Reserves. This is Anna Sanders. Thanks very much, John. And um, I really appreciate the kind introduction and invitation to present in today's webinar. We're really excited about participating in the upcoming Impact 5 Ocean Technology Panel in February. So I hope that everyone here registers um, and I'm just gonna make another plug for that. Um, my team is gonna be available at um, Impact 5 to, for additional questions, demos, and one-on-one -on -one training um, with our um, group of uh, specialists. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to be talking specifically about Global Fishing Watch Marine Manager Portal in today's um, discussion. We're really excited this week. Uh, we are going to be launching um, uh, some new uh, sets of data and information within the portal. And um, we're really gonna be sort of talking a little bit more about that project. But if there are other specific uh, questions that you have about Global Fishing Watch data, we'll be happy to answer those as well. So who is Global Fishing Watch? We're an international uh, nonprofit. We use satellite technology, machine learning, and data visualization uh, to build an accurate picture of human activity at sea. Um, we do this with free and open data and tools. Um, we were co-founded by Google, Oceana, and SkyTruth, and we really want to make sure that we're supporting greater transparency, um, this novel science and research, and obviously the sustainable use of our oceans um, and reduction of illegal fishing activity. Uh, we have 75 staff um, in over 20 different countries. I'm pretty sure we speak over 20 different languages. Um, and uh, we are, um, you know, a, a growing uh, organization. Um, our user base um, is in over 200 different countries, um, and we have over 88,000 users. So Global Fishing Watch Marine Manager um, was uh, brought about by thinking about how ecosystem-based management um, can be a central tool for the recovery of our ocean. But in thinking about all of these different data solutions, um, what we find is that often that data doesn't actually get to the managers. And so really thinking about how we can improve data fusion um, and make sure that that is getting into the hands of those decision makers who are ultimately implementing these MPA management plans um, is there's an opportunity for improvement. Um, and so in doing so, um, we have developed the Marine Manager Portal. And this is a dynamic, interactive, and free tool. Um, you can go online uh, to the Global Fishing Watch website and access it today. It was founded by Donna Bertarelli and other philanthropic uh, funders, including Ocean Kind, um, Bloomberg uh, Vibrant Oceans Initiative, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and we're using this um, to help support marine spatial planning, MPA management, and scientific research. Um, so here's just a few of uh, the different core components of Global Fishing Watch. Um, where current tools are complex and hard to access, Global Fishing Watch, we really want to make sure that this platform is accessible, is easy to use, um, and we have a fantastic um, design and engineering team. Uh, we provide nearly a decade worth of data, um, if you can believe it. Uh, uh, 2012 is uh, almost a decade ago. Um, this is near real time, so 72 hours delayed um, data and information. And we're providing this, um, again, free and open to all. Uh, the Marine Manager Portal has different types of data layers, and each of these portals is, is customizable per site. Um, and so what we do is we work with, and, um, with the different managers within these sites to bring in new data and information. So whether it's whale seeker data, or um, if you're thinking about uh, open ocean robotics data, like we can look to see how we can integrate it. But ultimately, there's three primary types of data, and this includes um, the human activity. So this is um, our um, data and information based on our uh, AIS data, so vessel tracking data, VMS data. We bring in um, different types of remote sensing data um, from night lights. Um, we bring in a SAR and um, optical data as well to help detect different types of vessels or infrastructure. 
Um, this also includes other types of vessels. Um, so we're moving beyond just fishing activity and we're bringing in uh, shipping, we're bringing in um, other types of tourism vessels to help make a better picture of the activity uh, within these marine protected areas and general ocean management. Uh, we're bringing in an oceanographic data, including sea surface temperature and salinity, and I'll talk a little bit more about our integration with Google Earth um, Engine, um, where we're taking in many different types of data sets. Um, and so we're working with different users to figure out how, um, which ones are the most important, um, and we're going to be creating a layer library where you can actually uh, visualize any of those different data sets um, easily. Uh, biological data. So we have um, included net primary productivity. Um, we are working with uh, University of British Columbia to bring in habitat suitability, as well as species rarity and endosome layer. Um, we have the ability to upload uh, animal telemetry tracks. Um, and so this, I'll go through an example here in a minute. So where, where have we started? So in 2019, we started this project and we uh, were working to co-develop this tool with these sites. What data is most important? Um, and we're looking at how our technology and data can help benefit room protected area managers, scientists, NGOs, um, and other stakeholders um, who can essentially help make this as powerful as possible for as many users as possible. And thinking about the scalability, we want to look at um, different sites that are maybe um, data rich or data poor, maybe some of the most remote places in the entire world. Um, but uh, you know, through this site engagement, we have in-person visits, we had COVID lockdown, but we were still able to connect um, with um, MPA managers or chief islanders, and Tristan, Ascension, uh, and Nui. And these are um, really great to learn about their specific use cases and how data can help inform and answer the questions um, that are most vital uh, to their specific area because every, every area is going to have different challenges. Um, I'll go through an example quickly. Um, Tristan de Kuna was um, one of our first sites. Um, we worked uh, with the Chief Islander um, RSPB, the UK um, uh, Marine Management Organization, and Puber Early Ocean Legacy to help develop some of their use cases. In this collaborative research, we were able to identify um, vessels that were um, using or not using night setting um, as a bycatch uh, mitigation measure um, in areas where there was a migratory route for the Tristan albatross. And so this is really important uh, to better understand the patterns and um, then communicate those to other uh, regulatory bodies, including international fora and, and management uh, bodies. Um, we have some additional use cases, our partners in Guyana, we're able to understand the increased vessel activity um, uh, from seismic and offshore uh, oil extraction uh, in their exclusive economic zone. Uh, so going into the portal, um, so we are launching um, <laughs> on Thursday, the global access. So we've previously been working with pilot sites um, and now we're providing global access where anyone can easily search for a geographical area uh, location and then create a um, uh, shareable private workspace. So we'll still have our focus pilot sites that we'll be working with. We have over 22 different sites um, that we have either private or public uh, portals with, and we're working with our, our different partners uh, for more uh, on the ground, um, deep engagement. So those could be those analysis cases. But if you're an MPA manager in Canada or the US um, or anywhere in the world, you can go in and create your own specific site and start customizing it. Um, so what we've included is um, global dynamic environmental layers. Um, so you're able to uh, use the time bar not only to see the aggregated um, sea surface temperature and salinity over time, but you're also able to then filter um, those specific data layers to be able to identify habitat suitability, for example. So going from global to local years to hours, a <laughs> fleet to a vessel is I think really important to understand. You wanna see that big picture. When I'm in the 
Coast Guard and I'm in the middle of the North Pacific, it's 3 million square you know, kilometers of, of area that I'm covering with my vessel. You wanna know and understand those big patterns, but you also wanna be able to drill down into specific vessel activity. And so our dynamic interface really allows you to look at vessel tracks as well as historical patterns. And now you're able to do that also with um, the environmental data sets as well. So uploading your animal telemetry. Um, so you can upload um, points, polygons, and tracks. Um, this is an example where we've uploaded a shark track or multiple shark tracks in the Galapagos. And that allows scientists and park managers to visualize uh, where those sensitive areas are or where there may need to be additional patrols. And so thinking about how you can combine that with the overlapping fishing activity data, the VMS data um, becomes really relevant uh, to these sites. Uh, we are providing um, powerful uh, and intuitive analytics we have a scientist on the, on the staff that really thinks about um, some of these different research problems um, where we may want to look at what is that activity over time? And I say to myself, if I could only automate <laughs> this scientist, then we can make that tool accessible to the world. Um, and so thinking about how we can look at understanding what the before and after effects are of establishing a marine protected area. This analysis would have taken over two weeks and you can do this in two clicks. And that's what's really um, exciting is that we're working with scientists, we're working with MPA managers to figure out, you know, what is gonna be most relevant to helping you manage your, your particular site. And if you're interested, you can also download all of the data through the map. So um, if you're interested and you want to work with other decision um, applications um, or tools, you can download that data um, at various different temporal um, and spatial resolutions. Google Earth Engine, um, they are one of our partners and we're really excited to make um, any of their um, data and information available and visualized uh, through the map. And so we are starting that with these uh, three specific layers, um, but in early 2023, we will allow for any of these new data sets. For scientists, this is really exciting because if you upload a model um, and you process it through Google Earth Engine, you can then easily display that within um, uh, the Global Fishing Watch map. So you can then overlay that data with, with um, our data as well. So just making another plug for Impact 5, um, we will be um, providing marine uh, manager portal, uh, portal training. Um, we will be on some panel discussions and my team wants to make sure that you have our email address. Um, so if you want to um, meet ahead of that, we would be happy to do that. Um, we are providing virtual and in-person trainings. And um, in addition to uh, launching this on Thursday, we'll have a user guide that will go through um, all of these different elements as well. All right, thank you very much, Anna. I, it's been exciting and, and really interesting to see how Global Fishing Watch has, has evolved and grown through the years. It's very cool. Um, so we now we now open up the webinar to the audience for the next uh, about 15, 16 minutes. Again, if you have a question for our presenters, uh, you can submit it in the question box uh, that's on the control panel on screen, and we'll be drawing from those questions throughout the, the Q&A session. Um, I, I actually have a question, and it's it uh, usually comes to mind when I'm learning about uh, new and advanced technologies to serve um, MPA managers and, and re managers in general. And the technologies that were described here uh, today are all pretty advanced, and each of you has uh, a comfort level with technology that's pretty high. A lot of MPA managers may not have a background in advanced tech, and some may be skeptical of or intimidated by new technologies like these. And have you encountered any pushback or skepticism from managers, and how do you respond? And I know, Anna, I, I suspect that in developing your, your portal, you've, you've encountered this, uh, this question um, you know, firsthand. 
I guess I'm going to go first. Um, <laughs> so, you know, what we do specifically is when we're having an engagement, we're going to go through a needs assessment and we're going to be able to specifically identify those stakeholders that we're going to be working with. So we don't want to force upon technology if it's not needed. Um, so we're going to be working to see, well, okay, of the data that you have, you know, is there any improvements that we can make? Um, and so what we often find is even just processing the VMS data, we find issues with it all the time. And so um, it's working to build that trust with those partners. Um, making a free platform really uh, is definitely um, mitigates a lot of concern that our stakeholders have um, for engaging with us because we don't have a financial agenda um, uh, behind our products. Um, and so really thinking about you know, our thoughtful engagement process and that co-development process, I think is really crucial. Our data may not be good in certain areas, but there may be other data that we could supplement. Um, there's a question about eDNA. If eDNA is available, we'd love to work on how we can integrate that for a specific site. And so thinking about those into, um, sort of innovative solutions with those MPA managers or with the other data owners within, you know, could be scientists, we look to see how we can collaborate and bring those stakeholders together. So there is pushback, obviously, um, you know, someone may not want their data to be public, um, but that's why creating something that is a both public and private shareable solution is great. So for example, I can create a private workspace and share it with Emily, um, but it's not public, it's not available to the world. Um, and so I can share my sensitive animal telemetry data with you, and then you can overlay your whale seeker data. You know, that would be a really great, um, you know, collaboration there. But making sure that that data isn't, you know, released publicly, um, may be in the best interest and in thinking about the ethics of making those animal telemetry data public, there are concerns. And so that's why we, we're finding a solution that sort of meets both of those needs and, and bridges that gap. Yeah, Thanks. I would, I would echo, echo a lot of what Anna said too, because, um, and it's also why we're really dedicated to working with off the shelf hardware, because there are people who recreationally have a drone just for their families and are saying, oh, if I could do this, you know, for my work, if I could sort of marry this personal interest that I have, um, it, it, they'd like to know how, but AI is so intimidating, or they think they don't have a half a million dollars to create something from scratch, which of course, you know, which is why we've invested four years of R&D so we can offer this just as a service to you. And we're really transparent with our pricing. We charge per image. So there's, there's no wiggle room. There's no question about how much it's going to cost. All of the data that are acquired belong to the people who took those data. So if they want to make it public, they can make it public. If they want to keep it private, they can keep it private. It's not our data to share we annotate the data for those ocean stakeholders. And then they're in the best position to know how to interpret those data and what to do, what for, for their actions to take with those data, how often to monitor. So we, so we really try and work with systems that, that are maybe very low tech and maybe they already have photos which is not very high tech. And we say we can work with existing images that you already have if you want to try us out. Um, there's so much more information that we can get to just besides just, you know, how many marine mammals are in those images. You know, how are they using a habitat? How are they positioned in the water? How big are they? Are they adults? Are they juveniles? So there's a lot more demographic and health, uh, health population information that we can get from that too. So like I said, it really matters um, on what questions are people trying to answer? What system do they have in place already? We can really meet you where you're at um, and scale something up if that makes sense. We can, we can step into a really complex multimodal detection system that is already existing and just help streamline where some bottlenecks are. So our, our goal is to really lower those, those 
like the mystery of it. It's not a black box. It is accessible to you. Um, we have a lot of FAQs on our on our website too of trying to speak speak in really plain language. Like, what is AI? What can I expect from this? Um, it's not an evil robot that's going to steal your your job. Well, in our case, it's not. And it's not, it's not the magic wand that's going to solve all the problems either. You know, it really needs to be all of these solutions working together and in a really collaborative way in order for us to scale and monitor the oceans the way that we want to. I can pipe in from a hardware on the ocean perspective as well. Um, that is, you know, it's, it's a very good and important question, um, not only for using, you know, our technology or, you know, ocean robots with MPAs, but all across the board, you know, there's, there's all kinds of questions, you know, is it safe? Can I trust the data? You know, is it going to, you know, have a negative impact? How hard is it to operate? Um, so I think working with customers and working with organizations that understand those customer needs are, are really important. Um, so for example, the work we're doing in, in MPAs, you know, that's, um, we're working closely with wild aid um, who you know really understand this pace and ensuring that you know we deliver it in a way that meets the needs of the mpa managers and for our technology it's also a service so that way you know um, they don't have to train up people or have the capital expense expense to procure the hardware um, so that makes it um, you know it's, it's it's the data that we're dealing with um, but i would say like across the board as as we see the scaling of of marine robotics and in every industry this is a really really important question and you know in in some parallel work that we're doing with the u.s navy right now um providing maritime domain awareness it's it's the same thing like how is this integrating with the navy ships you know how are these people who have never used ocean robots going to use this data what can we do to prove to them that um you know it's trustworthy Worthy, that it is, you know, the same or it can be even better than existing ways of collecting ocean data. So I think it's a really collaborative approach that is evidence based and, um, you know, continuing to work together in, in a very open and transparent manner to ensure that all those questions are being addressed um, and met as, as they need to be. That's great. Thank, thanks to each of you. Um, I mean, that, those are three really interesting facets that each of your answers were a different facet to the question. And it, do you have a sense of, I mean, each of you has been in this field for, for several years. Uh, do you have a sense of how far the field has come just in the last five years and where you think it might be in the next five years? How, how fast is it developing and how is the comfort level of managers um, developing in alignment with that, hopefully. I'll go. <laughs> um, great. So we're we're constantly looking at the horizon. Um, so most recently, we are looking at how satellite remote sensing technology archival data can be really useful for um, room protected area managers. Um, we are working with uh, National Geographic to process and, and update. Um, all of the MPAs all over the world with this archival data. But it's not just the freely accessible Sentinel-1 data, um, there's Sentinel-2, there's other new satellite sensors that are coming online. Um, uh, MDA actually made their 14 years worth of satellite archive data available um, for us to process for vessel detections, for fixed infrastructure. And this is gonna be really important to understand sort of the progression and um, the sort of the hidden activity that may not be um, readily apparent through other satellite based um, detection. So uh, whether it's vessel tracking data. And so this is really important in thinking about where do you plan patrols? You know, where do you specifically um, site a um, uh, marine protected area? Um, how is wind um, installation is going to be impacting um, migratory routes of albatross or other types of birds. Um, so I do think that there is um, sort of this explosion of data. Um, 
that we're working to sort of sift through and better understand, but we're collecting these use cases. So really working um, and getting that interest and, and getting that participatory effort from scientists, from managers, from enforcement to better understand how we can use these resources. Um, it's amazing. Google allows us to process petabytes worth of data. Um, and so, you know, that's fantastic. But um, what we really need to do is, is really gain, you know, what is the most valuable um, uh, use of that data for specific use cases for the greatest impact. And, and that's what we're really looking and, and hoping to achieve. Um, so yes, yeah, satellite remote sensing is coming online. Um, and then um, better use. So thinking about those use cases we're taking regulatory boundary, I know that we have um, both protected fees and MPALS on here, is thinking about how you overlap that and understand what the regulatory um, data and information is beyond, um, behind that. When I was in the Coast Guard, uh, I had to train pilots on fisheries management and they had no idea what all of the different regulations meant. But if I could put that data in their iPad, they could figure out exactly what is when they were flying over. And so thinking about how we can apply that similar innovation of making it easier for, for um, the managers and or the enforcement that's going out there, I think is, is really important. Yeah, I'd say on the hardware space and collecting data with, with ocean robots, we're really seeing a transformation in terms of, um, you know, the, the robots are getting more capable, able to go farther offshore, communication is getting better, sensors are getting smaller, more power efficient, able to measure more things. Uh, so I really do see the next few years being transformative in terms of uh, the acceptance of this technology to collect data that has good value. Uh, in terms of the other um, innovations that allow it to really uh, improve the data we collect. So for example, advancements in satellite technology and, and communication um, like low earth orbit satellites are going to be very impactful in allowing us to get high bandwidth data from the middle of the ocean. Um, and uh, we're, we're just seeing more investment as well in this space. And, and I think, you know, it's a recognition of uh, the need to, to get more data and certain kinds of data that, from the ocean that are really hard to get otherwise. And, um, you know, I think that these um, robot vehicles um, are able to fill a lot of those gaps. Uh, I, they covered it perfectly. I, I would say exactly the same things. There, there's, um, there's more and more, it, it's, it's becoming more and more accepted that this is the way that we need to scale ocean monitoring. Um, and that ocean ocean monitoring sort of is is different than terrestrial monitoring in in a huge way, and that is it's so data poor. And so for us to answer questions, we we need a lot. We we don't know how bad the problem is. We don't we we have so many gaps in knowledge that in order for us to monitor and measure things, there's so much that are just off our radar no pun intended. Uh, and so just ways that we can expand ocean data acquisition and then getting it into the hands of people who can interpret those data uh, meaningfully in order to take action, it, it means it needs to be um, shown in a way that it makes sense to the user and not an AI specialist, for example. So it's really, it's really the whole spectrum um, that I think people are understanding it's not just an AI or it's not just like a robot sensor issue. It's the whole system and it's collaborating that are, is really moving us forward and that idea is more accepted. Yeah, I love that. Uh, and we, we have time for, for one more question. So I'll try to kind of gather all the, the outstanding questions into one, but it seems like there are so many um, so many opportunities that are afforded by these new technologies, also a lot of challenges that are faced by these technologies and, and systems. Everything from, you know, how, how do you keep a robot going in really harsh, uh, you know, at sea conditions and, and, but on the opportunity side, can you use some of these technologies to uh, identify fish schools or, or um, um, plastic, uh, you know, accumulations in the ocean? 
So what 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 is the biggest challenge that each of you faces at this point? And how can the MPA field help you? I think from first. Oh, no, go ahead, Julie. <laughs> Um, I think from our perspective right now, it's really scaling our manufacturing and being able to get boats out there to meet the demand that we're seeing. Uh, and then, you know, getting feedback from customers, you know, what do they want? How can we improve this? How can we ensure that they're able to interact well with the data that we're collecting? Um, you know, we're a small startup. We, we pivot quickly. We have close working relationships with customers and, and we find this is um, really one of the best ways to make sure that what we're developing really meets those needs. Um, I would say the other one is regulatory. You know, regulations are still in flux. So, um, you know, the regulations in Canada are different than they're in the US and different than they are in other countries. So having um, more uh, uniformity and uh, predictability in, in regulations will also be very helpful for this interest industry overall. Okay, I'll go next. Um, so uh, from challenges, uh, I think, John, you actually said it in your in your statement, there's so many opportunities. And, you know, for Global Fishing Watch as a, you know, philanthropically funded uh, organization, we can really go in many different directions. And so by going broad, can you go deep? And so really making sure that we um, have a clear vision for uh, engagement and, and really grounding that um, with our users and our use cases, we could go off and do, you know, look at you know, oil spills or seismic testing or sand dredging. There's many different things that Global Fishing Watch could do. Um, but first and foremost, I think we're looking at how we can, again, create a more sustainable use of our oceans and really drive better governance um, and sustainable fishing. So we're gonna continue to work on that while still hopefully meeting the demand from, all, from, from our various different types of users for, for these uh, use cases, but again, it's it's really um, opportunities. You can go broad, um, uh, and I think you know here again engaging with MPA managers. I think is 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 one of those areas where we'd like to continue to to invest. And and we'd just like to get the word out that there are low tech solutions to scaling marine mammal monitoring and MPA monitoring. You don't need. Um, a military budget in order to do this at scale um, and something that's meaningful for you. And so, yeah, I guess that's just the biggest thing that we wanted to reach everybody. That's great. Uh, thanks, thanks to each of you. Um, so we're, we're out of time. Um, I, I want to thank Julie, Emily, and Anna for, for contributing your insights and taking the time to, to share what you're working on with our audience. It's, it's a privilege to have you here, and uh, I look forward to meeting you in person at Impact 5. Again, this, this webinar was a preview of the Ocean Technology and Innovation Session that will be at Impact 5 this February in Vancouver. And I encourage the audience to attend Impact 5 if you can. It's a great conference and an important one for the global MPA field. And the website is impact5.ca. So thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to the audience. Um, and have a great day, everybody. Thank you very much. We look forward to being at Impact 5. Thanks. Thank yep. Take care. <laughs>